our speaker is the proprietor of the internationally known Brattle Bookshop in Boston, and is also a guest appraiser on the PBS program Antique Roadshow. Please welcome Ken Gloss. Thank you. Uh, could you just move that chair next to you a little? It's reflecting the sun up into my eyes. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, it just, it's, I just don't want anyone to sit next no, to me. It, it, that, that, that's, that, well, they can sit on that side. <laughs> okay. The reflection was showing off that way. Uh, what I do want to talk, the talk will last 45 minutes or so. First half hour, I'll talk about what is an old book, first editions. I'll show off some of the things I brought. I'll tell some stories, anecdotes of places I've been, people I've seen, and a little bit of a background history of the store. And then what I'd like to do in the next 10 or 15 minutes is do question and answer because I can go on and on and on and on about old books. And at least with question and answer, I can go on about what you want to listen to. In the last minute or two of the talk, I will appraise one or two books from the audience to the whole audience in detail. After that, I'll end the formal part of the talk, but I'll stay here. I'll do any and all of the appraisals. I'll answer any and all questions. I'll just do it a much, much quicker so that we can leave here at some reasonable amount of time. Uh, I guess the first thing that comes up when you talk about old books is what is an old book? And usually people mean by that, what's a valuable old book? Well, the first printed book was in 1456, the Gutenberg Bible. If any of you have a Gutenberg Bible, <laughs> let me assure you that it's valuable. Matter of fact, the last time one sold, half of it sold for five and a half million dollars. Single pages sell between fifty and hundred thousand dollars on average, and some even more. But any book printed in the 1400s is valuable. Some more than others, but anything in the 1400s is valuable. After that, it depends on what the book is. You can have a book printed in the 1500s that was a relatively dull and an interesting book then, and it's still a relatively dull and uninteresting book now, and nobody cares who will pay anything for it. On the other hand, you can have relatively recent books. The first edition of the first Harry Potter book in London, which is about 20 years old, has sold for up to $80,000. So it's just a matter of what people are looking for and what they want. And I get loads of calls at the store, and people say they have an old book and they know it's an old book, and then wait, they know it's an old book, that the pages are all brown and crumbling. And this is a page that I'll pass around. Uh, you see it's not terribly fragile, the paper's white, the ink's black, it's one of the first books done with illustrations. And uh, this book was printed in the 1490s. So this page is a little over 500 years old. And when you sort of look at it and you say to yourself, well gee, if they could make books like that then, why don't they do it now? Well, there was a big disadvantage to a book like that. First of all, in the 1490s, you ought to be quite wealthy to get an education to learn how to read. You ought to be almost nobility to be able to afford to buy a book like that. Nowadays, maybe the books aren't quite as well made, but they're at a price that can be distributed in the millions. And the real value of books is the knowledge in the books and the dissemination of that knowledge. I think it's a good trade-off. Whenever someone, uh, whenever I do a talk about book collecting, inevitably somebody will come up and say, I have a first edition. How much is it worth? And I point out that most first editions never came out in a second edition, probably never should have come out in a first edition. <laughs> Nobody wants them, cares about them, or would pay anything whatsoever. A book has to be historically, scientifically, literarily, or for some other reason important that there's a group of collectors out there who want it. And usually when you think of first editions, you think of literature. Dickens, Twain, Falcon, Fitzgerald, Hemingway, and so on. And even within that, there are a lot of things that can make a big difference in the price. The condition being one of the most important. The paper dust jacket on a 20th century book can make all the difference in the world. My father had a copy of William Falcon's second book called Mosquitoes absolutely pristine, as if someone got it from the publisher, sealed it away. At the time my father sold it, he got within a week for $750. At the exact same time, another book dealer had the same book, Mosquito's Fault, first edition, but it didn't have the paper jacket. It had a few tiny little nicks and bumps, nothing terrible. 
it took them a year to sell it at $40. Because a lot of collecting is prestige. It's being able to say, look what I have. I have the best. I have the most wonderful. Essentially, I have what you don't have. And people who can afford it will pay absolute top price for the very, very best but might not consider spending anything at all for something even slightly less. Other things that can affect the value, signed by the author. Well, once again, if the author's unknown, unheard of, the fact that it's signed doesn't necessarily mean that much. Maybe one of your relatives wrote a book of poetry, had 50 copies signed and gave it to family members. Might mean an awful lot to your family, but it doesn't necessarily add much to the price. On the other hand, if it's signed by someone famous, maybe Ernest Hemingway, it could add hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to the value. In almost any type of collecting that you get into, there are nuances that add or subtract to the value, and I uh, use sign books to show that off a little. Uh, there are some authors that are almost impossible to get their signature. J.D. Salinger, for instance, who wrote Catcher in the Rye. He was reclusive, lived up in New Hampshire, uh, didn't appear in public, essentially didn't publish. And other than to a very close personal friend, absolutely would not sign a book. Thus, his signature adds thousands of dollars to the value because you just can't get them. This is, well, this is a little aside. Uh, once in a while, someone asks me, is there things that have come into the store that people have had that you would have loved to have bought, but you just couldn't? It's sort of like the fish that got away. Uh, a number of years ago, a man came to your, your sweatshirt made me think of this. Uh, uh, and hopefully they win tonight too, but that's beside the point. But in any case, a uh, man came in, he was a friend of J.D. Salinger, and he had a whole group of letters from Salinger, which were quite valuable and they were interesting. But there was one letter in particular that I liked. Salinger was relating back to when he moved into New Hampshire and built his house. And uh, he said that when they were building the foundation, there were a bunch of high school kids in the area who helped dig the foundation and get that going. He said, on, sort of on the side, and one of those kids was a really good athlete, that kid Carlton Fisk. So Carlton Fisk helped build J.D. Salinger's house. My feeling is that that letter should probably be in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, maybe he'll bring it in again someday, but in any case, it, it, it's one I haven't forgotten. Uh, there are some authors also uh, that uh, sign a lot of their books. There was, there was a local author, he wrote wonderful Go See Very Treasure Pirate Stories of the New England Coast. <clears throat> his name was Edward Rose Snow. Maybe some of you knew him or had his books. He was a character. My father knew him. I knew him. I remember he used to come in the store. And uh, Snow uh, told us one time when he was in the store that he had just gone to Cape Cod that morning. He had gone into a bookstore that he had never been in, never, didn't know the owner. Snow went right up to the section where his books were, pulled one off the shelf, opened it up and exclaimed, my, a rare, unsigned copy. And then he took out a pen and signed it. And then he introduced himself to the owner of the store. So books signed by Edward Rose Snow don't add as much to the value. Uh, my father had a copy of F. Scott Fitzgerald's classic. And just opposite what I was saying before, it, it was a first edition, but it didn't have a paper jacket. It was actually well-worn and read. But when you opened it up, it was inscribed to the greatest living poet, T.S. Eliot, sincerely F. Scott Fitzgerald. Now, in addition to that inscription, when T.S. Eliot read the book, he made marginal notes, annotations, comments, crossed things out, added things into just about every page of the book. That book now would be worth two, three, maybe even four hundred thousand dollars because of the association. One last story about autographs. There was an autograph and manuscript dealer in uh, Massachusetts. He was one of the more prominent ones in the world. And when he was a young boy, he used to collect books by Robert Frost. And he knew Robert Frost. And when he was 13 years old, he went to London. And he bought a copy of Frost's first book called A Boy's Will. Very complicated, what really is the first edition. Paid a lot of money for it at the time. Came back to New England. A few weeks later, he was met with Frost. He was very proud of himself. He said, look what I've got. And Frost looked at it said, what did you pay for it? And he told him. And Frost said, give me the book. And Frost opened it up. On the front two end papers wrote a two-page description 
of how to tell the first binding from the second binding, from the third, from the fourth, how they change bindings, why they change bindings, the different colors of the bindings, on and on and on for two pages, signed it, closed the book, handed it back to the boy and said, now it's worth what you paid for it. Uh, in any case, uh, let me digress a little, give you a little bit of my background, the history of the store. The history of the Brattle Bookshop goes back to the 1820s, but for all practical purposes, it was going out of business in 1949. My father was getting married, my mother had $500, and with that they bought half interest in the store. Uh, my father built the shop on his great love of books, his hard work, his knowledge, and he was a bit of a character and a showman. And we've uh, always been in Boston. Uh, when my parents bought the store, uh, it was on Brattle Street in Scully Square. Uh, people call from Harvard Square all the time saying, where are you? We tell them we're in Boston. And to make it even more confusing, Brattle Street doesn't even exist anymore. It's where Boston City Hall Plaza is now. And my father, we had seven different locations over the years, mainly due to urban renewal. Uh, and every time my father would move, when it was planned, he would move the best books to the new location and then run sales. Half price doll, a 50 cent quarter dime. Last day of the sale, though, everything was free. And he would literally have hundreds of people line up with bags, packs, satchels, whatever, ring a big bell, people go charging into the store, grab whatever they could grab. Five minutes later, he'd ring the bell again, that group would leave, the next group would come in, and he gave away over 250,000 books that way. Now, the last time he did this was in 1969, moving from the end of Washington Street to West Street, where we are now. And at the end of the giveaway, there were books left over. And like I said, my father was a bit of a character and a showman. And if you can picture this, he hired a covered wagon with a cowboy and a horse team. And on the cover of the covered wagon, it said, go West Book Lovers, go, Brattle, go 5 West Street Brattle Bookshop. Uh, they filled it up with books, and they drove it from the end of Washington Street near Boston City Hall, up Court Street, down Tremont by the Boston Common to where West Street is and then back down Washington Street with my father sitting in back, throwing books out the whole way. Now, the superintendent in charge of traffic was a friend, told me he could do it all morning, but within an hour, the city was in an absolute standstill. They told him to stop. He didn't care. He got his point across. And uh, we've been on West Street since then. And when we first moved in, we were in a five-story, 150-year-old wooden building, absolutely crammed full of books. In February of 1980, I got a call at 4 o'clock in the morning. The building was on fire, and it literally burnt to the ground. I mean, it was 100% gone. But we wanted to continue to keep going, not go out of business. We found a storefront a few doors up the street. We rented folding tables. People either sold, gave us, donated books. Kevin White, who was the mayor at the time, came down with a carload of books. And the main thing was just continue. We opened a month later, meager stock, but just keep going. Over the next four years, we slowly but surely rebuilt the stock. Four years after that, we bought the building we're in now, which is, again, a few doors down on West Street. And it's sort of the old Dickensian type of store. Outside stands at a dollar, three, and five. Two floors of general used books, and then a third floor with rare books, autographs, manuscripts, first editions, leather bindings, and so on. In that type of business, the large, old, general, secondhand bookstore, especially in the cities, is a dying business. And it's not dying because people don't like books, buy books, read books, sell books, but property value has gone so high, that rent has gone so high, that old bookstores, which I can assure you are not the most efficiently run businesses in the world, one right after the other have been going out of business. Uh, now, like I said, we bought our building in the early 80s, so I hope to do this for years to come. I have daughters who are in their early 30s. I don't think they have any interest whatsoever of coming into the business. And I've been doing, like I did, I've been doing this all my life. My parents say my first word was book. I imagine I, they were talking about them all the time. And I worked after school in elementary school, uh, junior high school, high school, summers during college. I have a degree in chemistry from the University of Massachusetts. I was going to go to Wisconsin to get a doctorate, but in 1973, I needed a year off. My father's health wasn't that good. That year now is a little over 40 years, and I don't regret for a minute that I'm doing this 
and not in a laboratory somewhere. If you would ask me, and I know this is small, I'm not going to hand, uh, show, hand these around, but they'll be up at the end. Uh, if you would ask me what's one item I wish I could find, it's a little pamphlet here called Tamerlane by a Bostonian done in 1827. It doesn't look like very much, but the Bostonian who did this was Edgar Allan Poe. It's his first book. It's a classic rarity in American literature. And the first copy actually to ever really be found and recorded was found in Boston in the 1890s on a deal, book dealer's 10 cent table. Another dealer spotted it there, bought a stack of books so it wouldn't stand out, and in 1890 sold it for $1,000. Then in the 1950s, there were two postmen in the New Bedford area who on the side uh, were book scouts. And being book scouts, they knew where all the yard sales were and so on. And uh, they bought a trunk of books. At the bottom of the trunk was a Tamerlane. Families got involved. They got to negotiating. And uh, they sold it within six months for $10,000. Now, I don't know if it was worth it, because they started out best of friends. By the time they sold it, they never spoke again. But they got their $10,000. And then about 20 years ago, there was an antique dealer in the Newburyport area who died. His whole estate was auctioned painting, prints, furniture, antiques, books as a group, $600 to an antique dealer in New Hampshire. They took all the pamphlets, put them in a box, $15 each. Someone, of course, picked out a Tamerlane, and 20 years ago sold it for $198,000, and one sold a couple of years ago for $800,000. And let me just say, this is a facsimile. A lot of what I bring with me are originals. I don't bring million-dollar pamphlets, but, if any of you want to take a close look and then go home and check your attic, cellars, basements, whatever, if you find one, please give me a call. I would love to hear about it. A lot of the fun of collecting, or what makes something valuable, is your knowledge, it's your understanding, it's your appreciation. I mean, someone might look at something and say, oh, that's a scrap of paper. Someone else might say, that's a broadside that led to the Boston Tea Party, that led to the American Revolution, that led to our country's independence. So it's really that knowledge and understanding that makes something interesting and thus valuable. Now, here's an item that on the surface I think is interesting, but the story behind it is even more so. This is on White House stationery, and it's uh, dated April 11th, 1933, and it starts, Dear Jim, I want to send you this note to tell you how happy I am that you are to represent the United States in Poland. It's a most important post, etc., etc. Signed always sincerely, Franklin Roosevelt. And it's to the Honorable James Michael Curley, Mayor of Boston. Now, on the surface, this seems like a great honor. It's an ambassadorial appointment. Well, Curley didn't think it was such an honor. Matter of fact, I think he thought Roosevelt was trying to get rid of him. Which, of course, he probably was. And Curley's response to Roosevelt was, remember, uh, in 1933, he said, in Poland, with Germany on one side, Russia on the other, you should send your worst Republican enemy to Poland. He said, matter of fact, if you think it's so important, why don't you quit and go there yourself? Now, Curley's opinion on Washington didn't change over the years. We also have about 10 letters he wrote to his wife when he was in Danbury Prison. Now, even though these were personal letters, he was still very much the politician. And there was one quote I particularly liked. He had just gotten into prison, and he wrote to his wife, and he said, Many of the four-legged creatures in my cell have more honor than the two-legged creatures in Washington. <laughs> in any case, enough, enough for curling. Uh, we get a lot of things in that aren't just books, but we get letters, documents, pamphlets, brochure. Uh, Here's a program from the 1912 World Series, where the Red Sox played the Giants. The Red Sox won the World Series in 1912, won a few more times in the teens, and then we had to wait an awfully long time. Uh, they're off to a good start this year. We'll see what happens. Uh, but not only is it interesting as a baseball item, but on the back, there's an ad for arrow shirts and collars. Collars are two for a quarter. Shirts are a dollar and a half and two dollars. A little more expensive nowadays. Uh, it's also 
become very popular to go on cruises and cruise ships. And I have a brochure here for a ship, tells you how wonderfully built, where to book passage. And uh, anyone who wants to go on the Titanic, uh, <laughs> this is a brochure for And you know, almost anything you can think of, there are people out there who are interested. There are whole societies of Titanic historians who do nothing but study the Titanic. And there's also a tendency that whenever you're talking about things collectible and so on, that all of a sudden everything seems to be worth thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. And I like to point out, not everything has to be high priced to be fun. Old Life magazines, here's one with Errol Flynn on the cover. Another with Elizabeth Taylor when she was 15 years old. And the large, large majority of these sell for very little. There are millions of them around. There are a few exceptions, but the large majority don't get a lot of money. Uh, but we used to have a wall by a stairway where we had a few hundred of the more famous lights hanging. People would stop and stare at that wall, sometimes half an hour, even an hour at times, just sort of lost in thought and memory. People loved them for the covers, the, the articles, the photographs. They made wonderful birthday or anniversary presents if you fell on the right dates. And uh, we had one customer come in, and he bought about 50 Life magazines from World War II. And it wasn't what he normally bought. So I said to him, why are you buying these? He said, well, I want to teach my children about World War II. He thought a nice way to do it would be to get some of the old lives, look at a few of the photos, read a couple of the articles, and then discuss it with them. It sounded like a good idea to me, but I was skeptical. He came in a few weeks later, and I said to him, how's it going with the lives? He said, fabulously, but not the way I thought. He says, the kids don't care about the stories, the articles, the photographs. But they love the ads. And he says, and it turns out by looking at and discussing the ads with them, he could probably teach them as much what the United States was like during World War II than if they had read and looked at everything else anyways. Um, I have a lot of other things in, in my bag. I have a cookbook from the 1700s. Some of the recipes are wonderful. And then you have how to bake eels the common way. I don't know if I want to bake them anyway, but that's beside the point. Uh, one of the most interesting parts about the business for me is going out to houses and estates. That's how we get most of our books. It's almost like being Jim Hawkins on Treasure Island every day, never knowing what you're going to see, who you're going to meet, the people, places, and so on. And I'll relate a few of those stories to you, and then maybe after that, see about some questions. Uh, I was out of the store. I got back, there was a message that a Mrs. Fisher had called and had some books. I called her up and she said, oh yes, my father died in Providence, he has 500 art reference books, we want to get the best price we can, uh, we're inviting a number of dealers down to bid on them, would you be interested? Well, 500 art reference books sounds quite a, a good library, Providence is only an hour away. They lived in an old street up near Brown University called Benefit Street. I got to the house, it was a large old colonial house, got led through the house, into a courtyard, into a garage. Second floor of the garage, they had 5,000 books. Well, it turned out her married name was Fisher, her father's name was John Nicholas Brown. Family founded Brown University, one of the wealthier families in the country. And after about six months, I bought 80% of the books I wanted. I was pleased, she was happy, and she said, my mother has a lot of books. Most are being given to the university, some are being sold at auction, but would you like to go to Newport to take a look at the books there? Their house in Newport is one of the mansions on the ocean. I mentioned this to my wife. She decided to come with me on this day. <laughs> and one of the fascinating parts about it was being in one of those mansions that was still being lived in by a family, and at one point wandering from the basement to the attic, all on my own, without a tour guide saying, come here, go, don't touch this, be careful, but literally just wandering through the whole place. It was fascinating. Another time I got called to Newport to do an appraisal. Now, when I come to groups like this, I do hundreds of free appraisals. Matter of fact, my goal is that whenever you think of an old book, you think of me and the Brattle Bookshop. I don't care if you think of 10 others, just as long as I'm one of the 10. And I have cards over there. We also, I'm doing a podcast now. 
uh, which I think is good, but uh, that's but it has about the podcast cards and so on. But uh, one of the ways I feel I can promote that is by doing as much free appraisal of free information as reasonably possible. Now there are times when I charge for appraisals when people need very formal written appraisals for insurance, estate taxes, or whatever, and then I discuss a fee. In any case, another mansion in Newport. Not quite as big as the Browns. This was the Perry family. Commodore Perry, Oliver Hazard Perry. And what they had was a whole series of letters uh, and documents from the War of 1812. During the war, their family were privateers. Well, they're privateers if you're on our side. They're pirates if you're on the other side. It's all the way you look at it. But it was the day-to-day -day accountings of the ships. And they were fascinating to read through. They would sometimes capture a ship and realize tens of thousands of dollars profit. In 1812, that was an incredible amount of money. Then one day, one of the ships got into a battle. The ship got hit. The captain got hit. He lost his leg. Three days later, there was a tiny entry at the bottom of a page, and it said, Captain, $5 bonus, loss of leg. And that was the last year of the captain. So again, that's a little different nowadays too. When my father was still alive, and he died over 30 years ago, we got a call from a lady, and she was very vague about her name, who she was, what she had, but it sounded like there might be a few interesting things. She lived in Sharon, it was fairly close. We got to her house, it was a little ranch house, Paint was peeling, weeds were growing, and you sort of say, oh, gee, what's going to be here? She answered the door. She was quite elderly. And we walk in, and there were just gorgeous antiques everywhere. I mean, really, really beautiful antiques. And she got to talking. It turned out she was originally from the Boston area, but she had married the prince of the Ukraine, the cousin of the Tsar of Russia. He had escaped just before the revolution. And she told story after story about being Russian nobility in Europe and all the court intrigues and all the goings on and how T.E. Shaw used to stay at their house all the time and how she didn't think he accidentally died on a motorcycle and there was a lot more to it. T.E. Shaw, of course, was Lawrence of Arabia. And she went on and on and on with these wonderful stories. Turned out her books were lousy, but the stories were absolutely wonderful. And when we first got into the house, on one of the walls there was... Ten watercolors. They were about this size, pastoral European scenes. And when I first saw them, I thought they were nice. And the more she talked, and the longer we were there, and the more I looked at them, the nicer I thought they were. And I finally said to her, Those ten watercolors, they're really nice. And she sort of turned around and said, Oh, yes, they're all Turners. So she had ten original Turner watercolors, probably a million dollars worth of painting. And it was like, Oh, yes, they're all. So you never know what you're going to see the people, places, characters. And a matter of fact, speaking of characters, about 20, 20 plus years ago now, we went to one of our customers' 100th birthday parties. Now, when you go to a man's 100th birthday party, and he tells you he just got back from Barcelona, he's going to give a talk in Florida, and he's been asked to lecture in Tokyo. And I finally said, wait a minute, you're 100 years old. Don't you think Tokyo is an awfully long way to go? He said, well, when I used to work, it took me well over 25 hours to get to Chicago. He says, I don't think Tokyo is a whole lot further than that nowadays. <laughs> and here's a man who could tell you about one day sitting down to dinner with Henry Ford and Thomas Edison. And obviously, he was a much younger man at the time. He said he was looking forward to this dinner and all the learning and insight he was going to get from these two great men. He got to the table a little early. He was excited about it. He said five minutes later, Ford came in and sat down next to him. And about 15 minutes later, Edison came in. Now, Edison was quite elderly, had one of those big horns for hearing, and sat down opposite. And he said the first thing, Ford turned to Edison and yelled, My Tom, you look very good. And Edison turned to Ford and yelled, It's the Carter's Little Liver Pills. <laughs> This man said all night long, all he did was yell about Cotter's little liver pills. And he said next time he wanted to learn something, he went to the library. Uh, I can go on and on and on with these stories. I'll tell one more, uh, and then we'll maybe see about some questions. We get hundreds of phone calls at the store. People wanting to know, do you have a book? Can you get a book? How hard is it to get the book? Does the book exist? 
or what's the value, how much is it worth, and so on. Most of those questions, either I or the people I work with, we can answer off the top of our heads. Some are a little more involved occasionally, you really have to do some research, but that can actually be quite interesting. But every once in a while, you get a call that really stands out. And again, this was quite a while ago. I answered the phone, hello, Brattle Bookshop, can I help you? Elderly lady, very thick Irish brogue, and the first thing she says is, President Kennedy slept with me. <laughs> you have to admit, it gets your attention. And she stopped and waited for it to sink in, and then she went on to explain that she had worked for the Kennedy family. She had been his nursemaid. When he was three and four years old, he used to fall asleep in her arms. So he did sleep with her, but maybe not what you first think. And what she had was a whole series of handwritten letters from the president. Now, presidential letters of any type have value. Handwritten letters from later 20th century presidents are quite scarce, rare, and valuable. She wanted to get an offer on them. I was actually skeptical about that, but I th thought she'd be fun to meet. So I went to her house. Uh, the stories, were, the letters were fabulous. The stories were great. I gave her what I thought was a tremendous offer on them, much as I suspected. There was no way she could sell these letters. These letters were part of her life. I left a note behind. As far as I know, her family still has them, probably where they belong, but who knows, maybe someday uh, the, you know, I'll see them again. Like I say, I can go on and on and on with this, but uh, why don't I see if there are some questions, uh, and quite honestly, anything you ask me, I can go off on a tangent. Uh, does anyone have any questions? No? No? Way in the back. How often does something come across your desk now that you're like, I've never seen this before. Uh, the question is, how often does something come across the desk that I've never seen before? Well, that can actually be answered in two ways. There's lots of books that I go and see and come across my desk that I've never seen before and I never want to see again. <laughs> uh, you know, they're, they're absolutely no importance, no care. Who could care? But, you know, and that's... Part of it. And even if I had seen it before, I wouldn't have remembered it. But for instance, uh, yesterday I was in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, and uh, I was working with a couple of other of my colleagues, and there was, it was a nice library. Uh, I bought about 40 boxes of books, about 1,000 books. And uh, there was one book in literally smaller than this thinner and smaller than this. And the title was The Titanic Disaster by a man named Chapin. Now, Chapin was on the Carpathian, which is the boat that picked up a lot of the survivors. And he put this out just for friends, and he had signed this one. He did about 20 copies. I have to admit, I have never seen any of the 20 copies before, but now I have one, and there are very, there are some, Titanic collectors who we have in the store, it's more a matter of who I'll tell first rather than whether I'm going to be able to sell it. But I've never seen it before. I actually had to do a little research on it. Uh, and, and so, you know, something like that shows up and it literally, if you didn't have a sense of it, you wouldn't know that, that it was anything special anyways. Also, too, when you, uh, anytime you're buying autographs, manuscripts, letters, documents, and so on, each one of those it tends to be individual. I mean, you might have had letters of Thomas Jefferson or George Washington before, but the letter you have now is a new one, a different one. So there's always that, that sort of hunt and search and things to, if you knew everything and if you've had everything and you've dealt with everything, it would get boring. But there's always something new and different and interesting uh, that's coming in. So, uh, and it might be, the same general type thing, the same general author, the same, but there's just a slight variation here or there, and that's a nuance that maybe I'd notice after years and years of this, someone else might notice, but even that nuance is, is there. So it's, it's constant. It's always, like I say, when we go out to houses and estates, you never know what you're going to see, and that's what makes it fun and interesting, and hopefully it will keep being that way. Yes. Any interesting stories from the Antiques Roadshow? Uh, well, the question is the interesting stories from the Antiques Roadshow, and I've been doing that now about 20-something years. Uh, now, I was just 
One of the things I love about the Antiques Roadshow is I've seen a lot of the country. I mean, I'm very, very fortunate in that, that my wife usually comes with me. We usually can go out to a city a day or two early, so we actually get to see it. Uh, two weeks ago, we, they were taping a show in Sarasota, Florida, and the next week they were taping a show in Tulsa, uh, Oklahoma, and rather than flying home, we decided to drive. So we drove from Sarasota to Pensacola to Mobile to Jackson, Mississippi to Memphis, Tennessee to so, to Tulsa. And you know, I thought Tulsa would be somewhat, you know, it's not a whole lot there, but the Woody Guthrie Center, and then they have a huge amount of Art Deco architecture because the oil boom happened to be in the 20s. And uh, that's when a lot of their buildings got built. So you learn things like, oh, why would I ever go to Boise or Omaha or so on? So that, that's great. And there are a lot of times, um, there are some things that uh, came in. Now, one of the things that sort of surprised me in uh, Tulsa, one of the things I ended up appraising that hopefully doesn't get edited for TV was, uh, so I don't know how many of you remember that iconic Boston school busing photograph where the man was being held and the kids had the American flag? I was right there and saw it. Yeah. I was driving a school bus. Well, the, uh, <laughs> this was the, the person, his father was the editor of the Herald, the photographer signed the photo to him, and uh, I know the photographer too. So, I mean, but I'm in Sarasota, Florida. Uh, one of the things that happens, in, and there's lots of stories, so I'm not going to spend hours on it, but one of the things about the Antiques Roadshow is we don't get anything from them. In other words, it's all volunteer. We, they don't pay our airfare, they don't pay uh, hotels, they don't pay anything. We, we pay all our expenses. And obviously, we want to get on TV. I mean, part of it, it's fun, it's very social, we go out to dinner, we've made a lot of friends, a lot of connections. I mean, it works in the long run. But there's no guarantee that you're going to get on TV. I mean, people come in, they have things. You can easily go a whole day, and nobody brings in anything that's really great, wonderful, interesting, that you can pitch to a producer and say, be on TV with. Or they bring in something absolutely fabulous, and they know absolutely everything there is to know about it, and you can't tell them anything, and that doesn't make good TV. But, so the ideal though, the absolute ideal for an appraiser on that show is, and usually you appraise from about 7.30 in the morning, sometimes straight through to almost 7.38 at night. Uh, and you know, it's a long day, but the ideal is to get on TV, and sometimes you're lucky and get on twice. Absolutely perfect is 8 o'clock in the morning, Somebody comes in with something, and it's a really interesting item. They're a really interesting person. They make great TV. And then you've been on TV by 8.30 in the morning, and the rest of the day is really easy. <laughs> Whereas if it's getting to be 6, 7 at night, and you haven't been on yet, it gets really tense. So anyways, this was in Kansas City. And a man comes in, and he has a few uh, things. He has rosary beads and a few things signed by Pope John Paul which are nice, but they're not that special or valuable. They're nice. But then he has a photograph of him and the Pope. But it turns out he was the pilot who flew the Pope's entourage all around the country. And there's a picture of him. The Pope is in full vestments. He's in his pilot seat. The Pope is literally leaning over the seat, not with his hand out and he's not bending down and kissing the ring. The Pope is literally one leg's up in the air, he's reaching over the pilot seat, signing his Bible. And I'm going, this is great. And I said, just let me see the Bible. He goes, oh, I didn't bring that. <laughs> you know, and I'm going, can you get it? And he goes, no, it's in a safe deposit box and uh, it's locked on Saturday. And I'm going, oh. You know, because he had great stories, he had wonderful, and it was like, oh. Uh, there are a lot of great things that come in. The one thing that I did get on TV with that I sort of really liked that wasn't what uh, you'd normally expect, there were a lot of Civil War letters that people wrote home, and they're not that rare. Some of them are much better than others, but a lot of them aren't that great, especially uh, personal letters. Anyways, there was this soldier, uh, and this did get on TV about three or four years ago, five years, I don't remember, but. 
four-page letter writing home. He was in the hospital in Washington. He was sick. He had dysentery or diarrhea. Uh, and he was writing back just sort of saying what his conditions was, hoping that he was going to get better, saying that he loved getting letters from home. You know, please, if it really brightens his day. It was a four-page handwritten letter, which is nice enough, except at the very end of the letter you looked, there was a little parenthesis, and it said, written by his friend Walt Whitman. So this whole letter was in Walt Whitman's Walt Whitman was a nurse and volunteered at the hospitals, and for a lot of soldiers who were either illiterate or too sick to write, he would write out their letters for them. And those letters actually are particularly rare, because anyone who knew who Walt Whitman was, literarily or historically, at the time, if they got letters from him, they saved a lot of them. But a lot of soldiers and their families and parents, they get those letters, they have no clue who well, and they eventually get disposed of. So that, those are actually particularly real letters. I but, saw that episode. Yeah, so that's one that I, I, uh, I mentioned. And then, and then you never know, you, most of the people who come in are, are a lot of fun. One last story, and this was one, a year or two my wife did it, she doesn't, didn't enjoy doing it as much. Uh, she helps out and volunteers and comes along. But it also shows how you can never make everybody happy. A lady came in and she had a book and she said, this is signed by A. Lincoln. And my wife looked at it. And you know, you look at it closely, people have waited in line sometimes for a few hours. It's hard to get tickets. You don't, you, you try to hold everything, touch everything, you know, give them time because that's, and my wife did that, looked at it and said, it is signed by A. Lincoln, just not the A. Lincoln we both want it to be. And the lady gets very, how can you tell? And she says, well, the first clue is, she looked at the title page, it was printed in 1905. <laughs> and, and the lady goes, so? And, 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 and my wife says, well, as far as I remember in history, he was assassinated in 1865. And the lady slams it close, and you don't know what you're talking about in life. <laughs> so, you know, in any case, uh, again, one of the things is stories can go on and on, but did you have a question? Yeah, I had, had a question. I do genealogy research, and uh, my grandmother was number 10 out of 11 kids in Nova Scotia, and her two older brothers were working on a sailing vessel, and they ended up in New Zealand, and because the trip was so horrible, they just ended up staying there. And in my research with the genealogy and so forth, I have contacted some of them. Anyway, a descendant sent me a whole bunch of stuff. And I've also got stuff from somebody in Nova Scotia. Anyway, was any of this kind of stuff at all valuable? These people are not famous. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I just don't know. Well, it depends a little bit on exactly how well they wrote, how much they wrote, whether what they wrote expands on the knowledge of the time and the period. If you read those letters and they wrote so well that you almost feel you're transformed from here to there, those are better as opposed to saying it was wet, it was cold, okay. it was dry, or in a boat, the wind was blowing, the wind wasn't blowing. Yeah. Now also too, when you get to Australia and New Zealand, what time period are you talking? Um, they went down there 18, maybe 1880s. 1880s is, is still would be good if they give very good accounts. If you had said 1820s or 30s, that would be much better because that's when the Europeans and were starting to go into that area. So it all depends. But usually good accounts really depend on the quality of the writing, what they're talking about, what's going on, how interesting are they. But South, the South Pacific, Asia, New Zealand, Australia, those are more interesting than if you said they'd gone to Germany or uh, so on. How, so, about, how about information from Nova Scotia about a minister and he stuff? Uh, the Nova Scotia in that period wouldn't, in general, I mean, everyone is different, would not tend to be as valuable because by 1830s, there were lots of people in uh, Europeans in Nova Scotia. So Nova Scotia, who was the 1600s, it would be more so. But again, it all comes down to the writing. And those are always, you know, yeah. usually the best way to get that appraised is, and this is the hard part, is someone needs to read it. 
yeah. which isn't always the easiest thing. And then what I tell people is, if you could write a one, maybe two page summary at most, of what's going on, when it's going on, where they are, and usually just from a summary, we can tell whether it needs a lot more work or whether general and so on. Tell you what, at the end, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna just tell a couple of last minute stories, uh, and, uh, and then what I'll do after that, I'll, do, I'll stay and I'll do the appraisals that people want. Uh, let me first say something about when I do appraisals to the whole audience, because the other, way I do it very quickly. When I do appraisals at groups like this, I tend to give a retail price. In other words, that price that you would pay that if you came into my store, that you would pay for it. it is, or in another store, it is not what you would get if you're selling the books. If you're selling the books, you usually get about a third to two thirds of the retail. If you're dealing with very cheap items, the markup might be higher, just because you're gonna make some money. When you get to very, very expensive books, the percentages can change because um, the amounts of money involved. Uh, a number of years ago, actually it's a good number of years ago now, we bought a copy of Audubon's Quadrupeds, not the birds, but the animals, but the big, huge uh, illustrations. At the time, we paid $100,000 for the book. We sold it within two weeks for $105,000. That's only a 5% markup, but it's $5,000. Well worth the time and effort we spent, and we pretty much had it pre-sold before we even bought it. So when you get to the much higher values, especially if it's going to turn over quickly, the percentages can come down just because the amount of money. Also, everything I say is subjective. In other words, the fact that I say if something's worth $100 doesn't mean a colleague says 100 and a quarter, and another colleague says 75. If you know what you have, you get a price, you're happy, great. If you're not sure, get a second, third, fourth, fifth opinion. It's almost more a matter of how much time and effort you want to spend. Um, one time, a few things that come up every once in a while is, uh, do I collect books? And generally, I don't. Uh, my father uh, used to bring home one, two, three books a day, do that for 30 or 40 years. And you can imagine how many books, and he just had piles, always intending to read a, a chapter, an introduction, of a dust jacket or something. And uh, I tend to read a lot, but I tend to read them and then bring them back. But there is one collection we have. The books before uh, the dust jackets, as we know them, they go way back, but as we know dust jackets, uh, they started around World War II. But before that, a lot of books had these very decorative covers. And the reason they had decorative covers like this was that if you walked into a bookstore and they caught your eye, better chance you'd buy them. And there are people who do collect books like this uh, just for the decorative covers. And you can go to library sales, book sales, historical societies, uh, flea markets, antique stores, and you can pick a lot of them up very, very cheaply. There are some that are very expensive, but you can get, and individually, they might not seem like much, but as a collection, graphically, they can be quite nice. And I started a collection like this myself where there was a bit of a joke. Uh, one day I got a book in and it had a picture of a toilet on the cover. And the title was, Flushed with Pride, The Life of Thomas Crapper. Went to the toilet. So anyways, I brought it home, showed it to my wife. She took one look at it and said, we have to put this in the bathroom. So we did. Uh, then a couple of days later, I got another book, had a big eye staring out of the cover. And the title was, We Never Sleep. It was a history of the Pinkerton Detective Agency, but with a big eye staring at you, I thought, I'll put that in the bathroom too. <laughs> now, this is a little half bathroom, so there's no shower, no steam. Next thing you know, we built bookshelves, and now we have three or four hundred of these Victorian style illustrated covers in our bathroom. People walk in, there's a little taken aback, there's loads of reading material. <laughs> but one of the rules of the collection is that nothing can be valuable because every once in a while a book falls off the shelf and you can imagine where it ends up. <laughs> and then I'd like to talk, uh, finish the talk talking about Bibles. And one of the reasons I like to do that is the Bible is the most commonly printed book of all time. Always has been, probably always will be. And uh, when I do Antiques Roadshow, sometimes uh, when you're doing that, uh, depending on who the other appraisers are, we even have a pool going of who 
how many Bibles will come in. One city one time we had 80 of the big old Bibles come in. Uh, but I sometimes at work get four and five calls a week with people of 100, 200 year old family Bibles. And in most of those cases, you have to say to the person, if this is your family Bible, it's been handed down through the generations, sentimentally, it's priceless. But monetarily, it might not be worth that much. Now, there are always exceptions. There's the Gutenberg Bible, there are others that's worth checking. And if you have those 19th century Victorian Bibles with a beautiful class, embossed bindings, and so on, um, those can sell for $100 to $300 in mint condition because they make wonderful gifts for ministers, priests, priests, divinity students. But break one class, have one hinge go, they lose all that value. Now, sometimes at the beginning, middle, or end of those, there's a whole family genealogy, the births, deaths, marriages. Many times, though, the historical society just wants to Xerox out that page, maybe the title page. They don't want the big whole Bible because it takes up a lot of room. Uh, in any case, I got called to a church, a, well, a, a church in Boston well over 100 years old. And um, they had a huge library that they just accumulated over the years. And uh, they wanted to know if any of those books were valuable. I spent a day there. It was a lot of fun. They actually had some very good books. At the end of the day, the priest said to me, could you come down the basement? There are a few more books. I went down and looked at them. And then uh, there was a closet. It would, it was a small room. It would have covered maybe this area. The priest opened the door, front to back, floor to ceiling, top to bottom. It was stuffed full of thousands of old Bibles. And I looked at the priest and I said, what is this? And he said, well, people hate to throw away a book. They feel it's sacrilegious to throw away a Bible. So what happens when a parishioner dies and the family doesn't want the Bible? They come and they present it to the church. And he says, what do we do? We very graciously accept it. We don't want to offend anybody. Then we go downstairs, open the door, put it in with the rest of them. And he says, we can't drive a dumpster up to the back of the church and fill it full of Bibles. It just wouldn't be right. So I use it as an example to say that if you want to give something to a charity, ask them if they want it first. If they want it and can use it, it's great. But if not, you're really not doing anyone a favor. Uh, I, I, I will plug a little. You, you had a, one more question? Yeah, one question about all these Bibles. I mean, it wasn't that many years ago, well, this church hated that church, hated this church, and they all had different Bibles. And uh, did this enter into any of this? Well, uh, that probably didn't, because every parishioner was a Catholic in that case. Well, in but, that particular but, instance, I'm talking about, you're saying, you know. Oh, well, oh. sure. There, there are, yes, there can be cases where sacred books are sacred to one and not to oh, another yeah, right. and, and uh, some, you know, well obviously the King James and the Douay version yeah. uh, were because the King of England couldn't get a divorce. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there are I mean, all this, and, and Luther, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, there, yeah, there are whole wars constantly about that or, you know. My father was born in 1902 and he couldn't play with the kid next door because he was Catholic. Well, talk. And, and my father was not. Well, know. talk about Korean. Right now you can talk about Koreans and Bibles. Yeah. Or, oh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, no, that can get into it. But in this case, it didn't because it was a Catholic church. Yeah. And all I'm yeah, assuming yeah. that all the parishioners were Catholic. They didn't have many non Catholic parishioners going to the Catholic yeah. church. But, it, it, yeah, anything can enter it into it. I mean, I can walk into somebody's house, look at their estate and library, look at their books, and I many times can tell you were they conservative, were they liberal, yeah. were they way off the end of one end of the other, just by looking at what they've kept, what they've read. It, it really can reveal an awful lot about uh, the person and the character and the personality. And you're not even Facebook. <laughs> not, right. People, uh, anyways, I will pitch. I do have a podcast that I've started doing. That's in the card. Don't ever feel that you and take my card. Don't ever feel that you're bothering myself, the people I work with, asking questions. We'd rather have 100 people call with nothing special than to have the 100 first person call and say, I just threw away a Tamerlane. So um, I'll end the talk there. Say thank you very much, but the way I do the appraisals is just more in a crowd scene. I don't do it to everybody. Uh, it just the less order there is, the faster it goes. And if anybody sort of wants to stand over my shoulder while I'm doing it and sort of eavesdrop, uh, I shouldn't say that. Just want to listen. Great, but otherwise, just bring things up. I'll say thank you very much and thank you.
scenes are fairly common. Uh, this thing shows up a lot. They, they sort of, um, how to do business, how to write letters. It's sort of a, a business etiquette book. And sometimes they get worn because they're big and heavy and so on. In good condition, they sell for $25, $35, $40. Oh, okay. So in that condition, not we quite. Yeah, well, you know, actually, it's amazing when I'm doing appraisals, how many people, when you tell them something isn't, you think, when you tell someone it isn't valuable, that they'd be disappointed and so on, more people are thrilled because then they can they can read it, yeah, they can, they can, they can have fun that. with it, yeah. they can give it to their grandchildren. They, it almost like you're relieving the burden from them. Yeah. I mean, obviously, if I said it was worth $100,000, you'd be happy too. I want it. But, <laughs> no, but, uh, uh, but uh, these are all dollar here and dollar there. Yeah. I enjoyed that episode of the Civil War. Uh, very, and, and it was there's, very there's, touching. A, there's a lot of other yeah, things yeah, that are very touch. Yeah. This is nice. This is more a, um, a, a nice book, $10, $20. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of this, but I'm going to assume that it's all there. It's about a two to $4,000 book. Really? Yeah. Even though, well, this Was there some defect to it? Well, it came from um, New York Public Library. Oh, uh, then it might cut it by two thirds or so. Uh, the, the, and the other problem you would have with that is somehow you would have to get a letter from the library saying it's been. We tried, we tried yeah. that. They never responded. Well, then, then it would be very hard to sell because obviously if I got it, I have to have title to sell it. In other words, not looking at it, not being the, anything about the library, it's a two to $4,000 book. Let me also take one other look at it. Because you've got the book plate. Are any of these, um, any of these plates stamped? Is there any other identification of the library? I think they might be on the spine. Yeah, here, here. yeah, they, yeah so, uh, well, see, sometimes libraries, they stamp the plates. So, no so, so you can't, them out of the, uh, the problem is ownership. And, you know, even if someone from the library gave it to you, let's say, or they threw it away, then they would have to have authority to do that. And that's actually, gets really, really tricky. There's a law called replevin, which means an organization, a state, a government can pull something back, even if it's hundreds of years been out of their possession, but there was no way, reason that even 200 years ago it should have been out of their possession. So you need to get a release. That's, and that could be tricky, because once something becomes valuable, they might not be willing to give the release if they don't have clear records okay. of what's going on. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So it is valuable, but. But. <laughs> uh, this is just a nice book, a nice humor. Uh, I don't know why someone has 175 pounds. I have no idea. Or maybe it's 1.75 pounds, but there's no reason it should be um, anything more than a few dollars. Okay, okay? I think yeah. right. probably the same on those. Well, the ex-library, you know, one yep. of the things, they're not in good condition. No. Nope. Maybe one of the things I can be encouraging about is the fact that these aren't in good condition really doesn't lower the price. Because in good condition, they're not valuable. <laughs> so, okay? Thank you. Thank you. I want to say this one. One of the problems is these are all I, uh, I recently uh, bought a group of these that he and all of it inscribed to his grandchildren, which was a, that made them very valuable. Yeah. Uh, what, 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 
No, these are. Uh, just, I was in the seminary in 1976 yeah. in Dover, Mass. A small Catholic college yeah. went under, so they invited all of us to get the books. Yeah. So I, did, I didn't, never took anything off, but it was this one of the ones in the hills. So these yeah. are the uh, and a couple of things. It, it's actually, I've been telling uh, my colleagues on the Antiques Roadshow that if someone brought a set of these in, I'd like to talk about it because, well, the, what I will start off is there, it's a great book. It's a, one of the best written autobiographies of a general. And it covers the Mexican and Civil War. It doesn't go into his present. But it's an absolutely fabulous book. It's well worth reading. But uh, it's not signed. A lot of people ask that. This is printed. Printed. And one of the ways you can be absolutely sure of that is that he died before the book came out. So it would be really hard to sign the book if he had died. Uh, in this condition, maybe fifty dollars. If the stamping wasn't there, it's about one hundred fifty to two hundred dollars. Yeah. Uh, it was an incredible bestseller. They sold about three hundred thousand copies of these, uh, and so they, they do show up. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good question. Thank you. And there's a more story. Don't forget these. Yeah. What? Uh, quick question. Yes. Uh, I'd like to say, say based well, on research, you know, society. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, research. Okay. So I've done a lot of things on Chick Stahl, who was in, committed suicide in 1907. Yeah. My question is, when you talk about the letters uh, and signatures, how do you authenticate? Well, it depends. Most of them you can authenticate just because nobody would ever, nobody would ever, because they're not worth anything. Uh, a lot of it is experience, and, you know, and then you get into science, and quite honestly, when you get to the really high prices, I have lots of colleagues who are experts in authenticating, and we'll work together. We'll work together. But, and if you're in baseball, one of our customers who we used to go out to dinner with years ago is Mo Berg. Oh yeah. Okay. So yeah. I, we went out to I went out to dinner with him numerous times. Okay. And if you talk about stories, okay. and there's a movie coming out too. But he yeah. actually sat down and told us about the atomic and the spying and yeah, everything. Um, yeah. but, okay. Um, so if I contact him by email, whatever, would you be able to refer me? To either I'd be able to or... refer you. Sports. Some people won't deal with sports autographs at all yeah. because there's yeah. so many forgeries. But I can get you in the right direction. Okay. 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 All right. Thank you sure. very much. Uh, okay. Well, why don't you pull them out of the bag? I'll do you hers first. Yeah. Get them out of the bag and then I'll. I've all the pictures. Small ones. That's all right. But just pull them out and. and uh, <laughs> Uh, it's a nice book. It's not terribly valuable. It's just $10, $20, somewhere in that range. And I think... All right. Here. This one's missing pages. Uh, Pilgrim's Progress was first done in the 1600s. The millions of editions. I'm going to do this very quickly. Another Pilgrim's Progress missing a half a page. The condition on these is really poor. Yeah, but that's 19. I mean, Dickens is a well Okay. Uh, this is a much later printing. The first edition doesn't look like that. So I can tell you really quickly. Uncle Tom, one of the things you check for on Uncle Tom, see how it says 30,000? That's telling you it's not the first edition. In other words, they had already done 30,000 copies before this one came out. In this condition, someone might pay $50 for it in shape. If it had been in good condition in a slightly later, it would probably be a couple of hundred. And if it had been a first edition, it might have been a couple of thousand. But that still has a little value. But nothing, we have outside tables at a dollar, three, and five. Almost all of this, other than maybe that, would end up on those tables. Okay? Sure. You have. Yeah, I'm just more curious than anything. Uh, Dana's Manual of Geology is a classic in a, edition after edition, sort of the standard textbook. This is not the first edition. Right. It's a 10 to 20. Yeah. Maybe 25. Well, I, I paid a buck for it at a Hans Brinker, I like the, the cover, is probably the nicest part about it. Yeah. Five bucks. And this is just a textbook edition across or a dollar or two. Yep. So, they, you know, nice enough books, but not bad. Right. I have a quick question for you. I've got my grandfather's. He was a World War I veteran. Yeah. 
and I've got his, his discharge you know, paper that's got, it's all handwritten in pencil, it's got all his you know, vows that he's in. What's the best way to preserve something like that? Uh, well, probably maybe get it framed, uh, the museum quality, the not UV glass and all that. It's probably as good as anything, and if you don't want to get it framed, you could just get a non-acidic acetate, put it in that, and then put it in a box and so on. Right. And actually, if you want to frame it and show it, and it means a lot to you, maybe make a really nice digital copy of it, frame that, put the other thing away right. out of the light. Same and, deposit box. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it's not going to be a value right. monetarily, but if it's sentimental, oh, then, then I would do it. And that way, if people actually touch it, hold it, Whatever they'll be touching the the fact similar. Well, and it, right, and it talks about the, the medals that he was awarded, and I have all those. Yeah, stars, so, so I mean, it's sentimental. Though. So, so if if you make a display, I would almost make a copy of the original, and it's almost impossible to tell nowadays. Right. And then have the original somewhere else. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Textbook, maybe it would get a dollar. Maybe. Okay. They say they got the release from library. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Child's got in the verses. It's a nice copy. There are thousands of different oh, yeah, yeah. This one's not in great shape. The two types of books that are usually in the worst condition are cookbooks and children's <laughs> books yeah. because of the way they get used. This would get five or ten dollars. Yeah, it's just oh, more a nice than I thought. Book. So that's yeah. pretty good. Yeah. Uh, uh, Hornblower people love. This is one of the. This isn't the first edition. It's one of the common editions. They're five ten dollars. They're just good reading. They're not that. This isn't valuable. Enough. So but it's they're good books. What about all the kids' little gold books from like magazines? We one time bought a collection about three or four years ago, four thousand golden books, and we sold almost ninety nine percent of them at a dollar a piece. At a dollar a piece, people loved them. They loved them. They looked great. They sold. We tried at the beginning to sell them for five dollars a piece, and they did sell one, two. We would have had them for the rest of my life. But at a dollar a piece, they went out. Now, the very earliest golden books uh, had dust jackets and all that, and some of those get to collectible, but most people don't have those. I've given some love to the kids, and they laugh and see what the back. And the one that sold the most was the funky little puppy. That, yeah. That's the one that everybody. We have like yes. 10 of those. Yeah, exactly. From different stages. Yes. I think I should have something I didn't bring with me. Sure. Away, like the Pope's Bible. <laughs> Thank you. Family ancestors. Well, I, I'd have to see it. So probably 50 to a couple hundred dollars. Somewhere in that area. Do you sell that kind of thing? You do. Yeah. 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 But that's what it would be. I mean, if it was signed by Lincoln, yeah. then, then it would be into the thousands. But if it's just people save and not do a ball, I mean, it's a special event, whether it was if for any president. People save them, they tend to show up. But probably 50 to a couple hundred uh, dollars. And it depends on which inaugural ball and how nicely it was done in the condition. Okay. But they do have value, but maybe not you know, huge. Right, right. You just couldn't get a hand written in the Yes, I see. Okay. Interesting. Thank, Thank you very much. That was a great evening. Thank you.